on recruitment having reached a point, we will now move on to the concerns of selection. But before we do so, a quick recap of the elements of recruitment which will lead to a transition understanding. I had talked of uh, the diverse workforce and its arguments. We must look at recruiting from wide range of people for obvious advantages of uh, having objective standards and promoting a feeling of inclusiveness and openness in the target groups. In many cases, this may create language implications, but that is another story. Now, let us link it up with the selection processes and see where we are. Selection processes also require tests. Any instrument that is used to make a decision about a potential employee can be used as a selection test. In fact, rating applicants or knowledge, aptitude, personality, abilities, honesty and motivation would be an essential part of any selection test. The advantage of having selection tests is that it reinforces credibility, is linked up with uh, verifiability and develops connectivity with past uh, researchers and thinking in this area. Therefore, is amenable to drawing greater talent who would have faith in the selection process. There is a greater link therefore, between reliability and validity which I have just talked about, but then the outcome has to be standardization. Tests have to be conducted in a manner where there is a universe uniformity of procedures and conditions related to administering tests. Standardization helps one to reach out to a wide segment of the supply side, which is particularly useful if the organization is a multi location entity. The selection tests are known generally to cover some of the following. domains. They conduct cognitive aptitude tests, which measures reasoning, vocabulary, verbal and numeric skills. These are tests, which come under cognitive aptitudes. There are tests, which come under job knowledge, measure knowledge regarding a particular job. There are work sample tests, which allow candidates to demonstrate how they would work on the job. In fact, there is much to be said for work sample tests. Some decades ago, when I was working in the industry, I had occasion to work. with an outstanding engineer, who was of the opinion that uh, career for engineers should be as broadband and as capable of creating top positions as for managers. And he was of the view that unless this is done, it would be impossible to prevent a wide extended pull which managerial careers exercise on engineers. So, in this particular joint venture, which was between an Indian firm and a Japanese firm, 
he created career paths for engineers which concluded not only with chief engineer being equivalent to a general manager, but if you had an executive director HR, you had an executive director engineering and mind you not in ex just executive director technical. And for selection processes, when taking people at the entry level, he would not confine himself to just group discussion and interviews and written tests, but he would actually put them on the shop floor for a week. And against a predetermined evaluation sheet, somewhat equivalent to a job card, he would observe the 10 or 15 people shortlisted for the actual job for about a week. And then he would do the selection process. It produced excellent results. Notwithstanding the excellent results which it produced, that method does not seem to have been replicated in many work situations and the results are for all to see. But to get back to what I was elaborating, work sample tests allow candidates to demonstrate how they would work on the job. Not only do they show how they would actually work on the job and thereby create a more rational basis of selection, the psychomotor abilities tests with which when matched with work sample tests combined give a view on the personality of the applicant which is very, very useful for engineering jobs. The purpose here is not to recommend one set of elimination selection procedures versus another set of elimination or selection procedures, but the purpose is to demonstrate how various techniques can be used for selection and the ultimate choice would lie with the superiors in the organization to determine what it is that they seek to find out from which effort and ultimately find the way forward. There are of course, any number of personality tests, vocational interest tests and believe it or not, they have also devised honesty and integrity tests. I do not think it is necessary for me to elaborate upon all this because personality tests are assess traits with personal characteristics. They are used to determine if applicant is the right fit for the organization. The vocational interests identify occupations in which the candidate is most interested and honesty and integrity tests seem to be the much needed ones today. What results they produce is another matter but that is a subject which we do not want to get into here. The selection tools and predictors of job performance are the following. This is a non exhaustive list, but for those of you who have yet to enter the job market, it will be an indicator of what you have to be prepared for and that may be lot more than just professional knowledge. In fact, for selection to discriminating organizations, there is no substitute. for being a well rounded personality which will make the grade anywhere, any day, any time. And one has to be cognizant 
that uh, ultimately the test selected say as much about the organization as the results of the test say about the personality of the person subjected to those tests. Then there are issues of letters of recommendation. There are certain job markets when letters of recommendations are very highly tracked, very highly valued. And I have heard some recruiters say that letters of recommendations from certain segments are not even worth the paper on which they are written. Very difficult to strike a judgment on this, because if you do not select by recommendation, what is it that you select by? And if you select by recommendation, what is the kind of weightage you can assign to that kind of recommendation? And what is the kind of integrity that that recommendation would show? A lot of questions. Predictably, like any situation, many questions, few answers, but that is the way it rules. The challenges in selections are determining the characteristics most important to perform on a given job. And after you have administered all the tests, after you have administered all the questionnaires, group discussions have been undertaken, essays have been analyzed, motivations for applications have been measured, there is still no substitute for the sound judgment of the selectors in a live interview situation. Therefore, determining the characteristics most important to performance are also a factor of what the selectors consider important. And unless the selection process is very, very rigorous, it is obvious that uh, The determining characteristics for performance sometimes tend to be so personalized that a group of selectors from a given organization may have their own hierarchies, but it is hoped that their hierarchies are not too far removed from the objective scale of hierarchies. Measuring the characteristics that determine performance therefore becomes a key determinant of behavior and evaluating applicants and their motivational levels are the key elements which need to be understood. But all said and done, one of the key questions which organizations have to answer is, who should make the selection? Now, be it the government, be it the private sector, be it uh, the public sector, any number of models are, have been tried. There is the search and the advisory committee. The search committee has an advisory role because selection is with a person who may not necessarily be a member of the search committee. It then goes to a committee which may or may not have the access 
the interest or the time to get into respective biodata is unless it be by exception and they have the personal call they have the last call and their call is binding so you go through three steps where the most important filter is the least powerful filter unless it be by a process of elimination so these are mysteries to which it is difficult to find explicit answers but by and large and this is the redeeming feature the recommendations of the search committee are honored and the deviations deviations which take place are usually and even that not commonly of inverting the rank order sometimes a second may be preferred over the first candidate but that also is not usually the rule then there are committees where the selection committee has the last word like for example in upsc the selection committee has the last word that's why you call it the commission and the chairman of the commission has a statutory rank yes it is referred to other departments other wings of the government who may have a veto but not with reference to the competency of the person for example it may go to vigilance and vigilance may on uh, cognizable evidence have a doubt about the integrity of the person and in which case the selection doesn't go through but the vigilance has no business to exercise a judgment on competency and there are other examples which can be given in an era of doubting thomases and an in, in an era of uh, wild allegations and some genuine doubts perhaps it's worth reiterating that by and large most of the selection processes in this country are sound because if they were not sound whatever be the level of functioning character of this nation would have been seriously jeopardized and i hope that day is even beyond the domain of comprehension it appears therefore that there is no healthy pattern of selection over and beyond what practices have established and they may not always follow the textbook style then there are legal issues in selection there is the discrimination law which de develops clear policies on hiring as well as disciplining and dismissing employees it's a complicated domain and we shall be shortly coming to the indian law and the public the uh, industrial relations activity but for the moment let me tell you the laws of discrimination vary from community to community for example in india you cannot be discriminated on account of religion in india you can't be discriminated on many other dimensions the details are not necessary to go into and these criteria for not being the touchstones of discrimination vary from community to community for example in usa you can't be discriminated on age whereas in india it happens all the time 
Now, this is not to get into a comparative study of discrimination laws, but presumably laws are formulated to meet certain social needs for which the legislature is responsible. Then the other legal issues in selection have to do with affirmative action. Check laws of the land regarding hiring applications with criminal records or looking at applications which have to do with reservations, which is a part of affirmative action or as now seems to be the case, certain positions being secured on basis of gender. The stated objective of all this is to create a social equity. Many debate this. Many have reservations on this and in fact, it is argued by several people that it causes reverse discrimination. But that is an argument which we cannot get into here, where we are looking at issues of recruitment, selection etcetera. From a managerial perspective, therefore, our interest and focus for the moment is almost entirely descriptive and narrative. Then there is such a characteristic as negligent hiring, which means learn as much as possible about the applicant's past and work related behavior. Is he known to be erratic? Is he known to leave a job half done? Is he known to fly off the handle? So, a little bit of discrete sourcing almost in a manner of industrial sourcing of information can lead to a handling of negligent hiring. Now, the most popular method of recruitment selection is interviewing candidates and I am quite sure many of you will be interested in this process. Using an interview team consisting of representatives from the various areas of the organization can be more effective and you heard me say that at the end of the day, after you have conducted all the tests, all the interviews, all the instruments have been used and applied, there is no real substitute for good judgment of the selectors. The disadvantage is that larger the team, the more difficult it will be to find a time and place in everyone's schedule to make the interview happen and this continues to be a very real situation where the fanciful statement is, oh, I will be travelling. I have not for one understood why people need to travel so much in an era of video conferencing and in, a, in an era of the electronic medium being almost universally applicable. But there is a certain value attributed to travelling and in fact, if you are important in the hierarchy, you are almost available in your headquarters by exception. On a lighter vein, I once raised it to the former chief executive of a multi location organization. India based, but uh, rooted in many parts of the world. And I said, the serving CEO, Mr. Swenso, is almost never to be found in this city. How does one meet him? And the ex CEO, many years his senior, turned around to me with a straight face and sipping his cocktail, he said, 
you know his job requires to travel so much how would he ever do his job without traveling now he was so senior i couldn't cross examine him on this but a question did come to my mind and with with great deal of trepidation i posed to him i said when does he do his job which is to be done at the headquarters he said well there is the electronics medium you see and they keep reaching out to him and he attends through it in an email and phone and gives instructions and it's carried out and i said and why can't it be done on the reverse with his staying here and looking at other places through the same medium to which he said marketing does not take place without continuous contact project teams don't work without a continuous contact so he has to keep traveling to locations and i realized that was the time for me to get out of that conversation because i was not competent to strike judgment but yes it is very difficult to get even an interview panel of four vips all together in one city at one time they are found usually simultaneously not only in different geographies but different time zones not only in different time zones with almost career objectives one is chasing one sector the other is chasing another sector the third is in some international forum how on earth they coordinate the strategic plan of the organization is something which can be answered by only a person who has operated at that level but the premium of traveling doesn't necessarily and doesn't always convert itself into a business advantage but that's another story additionally the candidates are likely to find a panel interview more stressful hmm well the experience of an interview has spawned almost a profession where people run coaching classes in facing interviews but we don't want to get into that all that i'm saying is the advantages and disadvantages of interviewing candidates there can be a structured patterned interview which is based on a preset list of questions they are asked of all candidates yes some questions have to be asked of all candidates as uh, some questions have to be asked of all every individual candidate in a fresh manner so that he doesn't go out and brief those people waiting on what is the repetitive pattern of questions in which case the questioner loses his advantages so a structured interview is based on a pre-list set list of questions that are asked of all candidates and this allows for consistency and fairness in the process so like everything else this argument cuts both ways ultimately it can be only said that that which works works that which doesn't work would need to be debunked and that's the way, way forward unstructured interviews involve open ended questions that allow the candidates to express his thoughts and feelings that might be relevant therefore whether it is a structured interview or an unstructured interview it is a question of the choice of the selectors and very often they combine both the methods then there is the situational interview this is characterized by questions like why would you like to join the organization or what would you do in this situation or allow the candidate to speculate on how they would handle a particular job situation in effect therefore it is possible to recognize a situation where the pattern of an interview is determined by the pattern of the orientation of the members who sit on in the interview then there is the behavioral interview 
which requires the candidate to give a real example of past action and results. Many interviewers revel, uh, revel on this. It is based on the proposition that past behavior is a good predictor of future behavior. And again, I am not going to get into a discussion of the validity or otherwise of this profession. Now, of this kind of profession or expression of the slant of the interview. Selection processes also have to do with behavior background verification. According to ADP screening and selection services, forty percent of the applicants lie about their work histories and educational backgrounds. The references are given there, so that I do not have to generate any responses to the veracity of these figures. 20 percent present false credentials and licenses, 30 percent of job applicants make material misrepresentation on their resume. Another survey found that 95 percent of college students said they would lie to get a job. 41 percent said that they had already done so and 15 percent top executives falsify resume information. A pretty dreary scene, but let me tell you the problem is not as big as these figures may show. Both because of genuine risks you run. And because of insights many people do have in looking at these resumes and they can make out. And worse still, the risk of losing a job once it is detected that you falsified some data or another and uh, channels and media in popular public domain is full of stories of people who could not walk away with this falsehood. So, it is best that this be not attempted because the risk factor is just too large and may strike just too late for you even to recover. Imagine they are catching up with your first with your false credentials when you are 50. And then what happens? And all organizations are known to be very severe in punishing falsification of applications. But that is not the purpose of the narration. The purpose of the narration is that you should be able to do up a biodata which is credible, reliable, and there are ways of screening it too. So, the suggestion is very simple, do not use adjectives about yourself, give the factual information and most discriminating people who read that kind of biodata are able to see through the kind of presentations, the kind of credibility the background presentation has. What is more, in most situations there is a structured application form to fill and the application form is usually drawn up in a manner where it is possible, probable and whenever you choose inherent that the facts be screened. And finally, at the time of actually being interviewed or at the time of joining, almost all basic credentials are checked out in original. Now, if somebody has the rare ability to falsify data in presentation, to carry it off in conversation, to fabricate documents to present a credible check, 
survive the background verification which is open to the employer through whatever channel he may deem fit will still not be able to handle for a lifetime any chance discovery, any chance recheck and in any manner where falsification would be difficult to live because there are too many circumstantial evidences. But having said that, the current trends in recruitment and selection include procedural changes which has eliminated arbitrary rules and regulations that restrict the choices of hiring managers and supervisors. A lot adopting flexible and appealing hiring procedures, screening applicants quickly, validating entry requirements and examinations, instituting worker friendly personnel policies and creating more flexible job descriptions. Therefore, like everything else, trends in recruitment and selection are also evolving and are positioned differently. To carry the discussion further, the improvement in the recruitment and selection procedures include decentralization of HR responsibilities, aggressive outreach efforts and current employees as recruiters. In academia, in civil services, in the industry and indeed wherever the employment is to be found, new techniques and methods are being used and the recruiters themselves are creating norms of standardization of evaluation procedures. so that it is not possible to have biases of one panel affecting the results of the overall assessment of four panels because somebody somewhere has the right of moderation of the grades and the results. So, by and large we are at a stage where recruitment and selection procedures do have a credibility like any other human effort, they are not foolproof and no one can argue that they cannot be tampered with. But then any system survives on its credibility depending upon the chances of tampering and the chances of scrutiny which can be always undertaken mid-career not to overlook the fact that every recruitment has the reverse procedure of dismissal, suspension, investigation and ways through which somebody can be eased out. Be that as it may, the overall recruitment and selection processes have gone through large degree of decentralization and the outreach efforts have widened the supply side where genuine choices have been created. There are ways in which the eva uh, evaluation of the recruitment and selection processes can take place and let us look at some of the elements of evaluation of the recruitment and selection processes. There is the cost and all selection and recruitment processes have a budget. So, the question is asked, did you stay within your recruitment budget? all of them have a time dimension. So, the question is asked, how long did it take 
you to fill the position. Quality. Were your applicants well qualified for the job? Longevity. What about turnover? Do your new hires stay for long term? So, be it cost, be it time, be it quality, be it longevity, all these elements can be used for evaluating recruitment procedures. And ultimately, like every organizational act, recruitment procedures have to be evaluated for their gaps and pitfalls and how they can be improved for future action. Use of technology in recruitment and selection procedures is also a dimension which needs to be referred to. Technology will be the most notable HR trend in the next few decades and this goes without saying because several of the objective type questions which have to be answered in written tests are evaluated mechanically. So, in no intervention is possible there and there are many other ways in which technology has made the evaluation processes extremely tamper proof. Many large organizations use computer bulletin boards and electronic mailing to improve recruitment processes and many of you would be already aware of that. Managers can have online access to applicants test scores, qualifications and contact information and this is becoming increasingly widely used and that itself is a very confidence restoring process. The software program to administer online examinations track applicants, match resumes with skill sets, expedite background checks are all in place. In other words, it is not only the software which is being continuously upgraded to yield better results, but the, if I might say so, the soft skills applied in recruitment and selection processes are also being reviewed for higher sophistication, better reliability and a large number of uh, tested evaluation methods supplement personal judgments and in the ultimate analysis the evaluation is a result of a certain ratios which have been predetermined. That brings us really to a study of what could be called skills, skills which here is referred to as a global currency, it is sought everywhere. Selection and recruitment procedures as I have just tried to establish with you are by and large meant to identify skills and that is where this narration began. So, the statement that skills are a global currency, countries with significant skills capital can innovate, remain competitive and enable sustainable growth and a good example is Japan. It is not a country with very large resources, it is not it is a country where there is a population bias in terms of aging and yet Japanese industry in the last 30 years or so has come out to be hugely competitive at the global level and tends to hold its own product for product against products which come from very much more resource generous communities and it is still able to hold its own. Skill development will create inclusive societies, because 
the criteria and the touchstone of the selection would be skill and not pedigree. Skill development should be added as a UN miles millennium goal, but that is another story. There are four collar workforces, the white collar, the gray collar, the blue collar and the rust collar and let me walk you quickly before we conclude this component of the evaluation processes and the evaluation analysis. White collar is well understood across the world therefore, does not need a definition white collar is the executive collar. The gray collar is the knowledge worker which includes the ICT skills, the problem solving analytical ones and the effective communication skills just below the top level, but yet not quite the shop floor level, but the level which specialized skills, the knowledge worker, the ICT skills, the problem solving analytical skill, you know the statistician, the analyst, the public relations person and the list goes on, but all of them are a level below the top. The blue collar worker, the shop floor worker in the manufacturing and in the serving sector literally the shop floor worker because the blue collar comes from the expression of blue overhauls and finally, the red collar worker, skilled worker at the grassroot level in currently unorganized and unbenchmarked sector. What are the unbenchmarked sectors? Construction, agriculture and many other trades and the list is almost endless. They are rust collar workers because basically skilled workers, but since they work at a grassroot level, they tend to languish without a name there, because they are unorganized, unbenchmarked and the illustrations only show that they are in some of the critical sectors of the economy and that is what makes it significant. We then move on to the analysis of the patterns of skill formation, but that will be another treatment. Thank you for now.